So now with the basics of nitrogen fixation under our belt and having made ammonia from nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, we're ready to move on to the next step of nitrogen metabolism, which is essentially the anabolism of nitrogen, making amino acids with nitrogen. Again, I'll remind you, we're not going to talk about making any other nitrogen comp containing compounds, but we will scratch the surface of amino acid biosynthesis. And we'll end this chunk by talking about the essential amino acids briefly and just kind of defining them from a dietary point of view. The last chunk, chunk C, we'll talk about the catabolism of amino acids, how we break amino acids down. So for amino acid biosynthesis, we have as our only, really, nitrogen contributor, ammonia, the ammonia we just made in plants through nitrogen fi fixation. But that ammonia is highly toxic. So as soon as it's taken up by a plant or even by a person or any living cell, it really can't stick around as ammonia for very long because of its toxicity. That ammonia has to be used very rapidly to avoid harming the cell. And when we say use, we mean that ammonia needs to be converted into something that's non-toxic, some other nitrogen-containing molecule. This is primarily accomplished by using that ammonia to make the amino acids glutamate and glutamine. So glutamate and glutamine are going to be our entry points for ammonia into non-toxic nitrogen-containing compounds. Glutamate is made directly from alpha-ketoglutarate. Hopefully that rings a bell. That's an old buddy of ours, alpha-ketoglutarate, from the citric acid cycle. And alpha-ketoglutarate is made into glutamate really through the addition of ammonia. So here is alpha-ketoglutarate. Here's a single ammonia ion. And with a little bit of electron-powered energy from our high-energy electron carrier NADPH, we can go ahead and make glutamate and lose a water. So essentially, we're removing a water molecule and substituting it with an ammonia molecule. And we've just converted toxic ammonia into very not-toxic glutamate. So glutamate, and, and that becomes the amino group of that amino acid. That ammonia that we just absorbed is the amino group of that amino acid. This is the alpha carbon right here, and here's the carboxy group. Here is the side chain of glutamate. Then we can make glutamine from glutamate directly. We can absorb yet another ammonia molecule, another ammonia ion. And here is the glutamate we've started with. We're going to use energy not from electrons this time, but from ATP, and the energy from ATP is going to be used once again to swap out water and swap in that second ammonia. So again, we're losing water and gaining the ammonia. You'll notice that the ammonia in this place has gone onto the side chain of glutamate, creating glutamine. Glutamine is one of the amino acids that has an amino group in its side chain. Glutamate is made via a reaction type that we call reductive amination, the addition of an amino group through a redox reaction, through a reduction reaction. So we've added this uh, amino group because of the reduction of our reagent and the oxidation of NADPH. Glutamine is made by a reaction type called amidation, and amidation is the addition of an amino group through uh, energy from ATP. So essentially, glutamate accepted one nitrogen as its amino group, making it an amino acid. There's the amino group right there. This amino acid uh, becomes the alpha amino group. Or this amino group becomes the alpha amino group on the amino acid glutamate. And glutamine accepted a second amino group, which became part of its side chain. There we see that side chain amino group right there. These accepted amino groups can be donated to other molecules later on in other biosynthetic pathways. Think of glutamate and glutamine as amino group or ammonia shuttles. Our bodies and our cells move ammonia around by making glutamate and glutamine. Ammonia is toxic. Glutamate and glutamine are not toxic. And so glutamate and glutamine are the safe ways of moving ammonia around. When that ammonia is moved and transferred from glutamate or glutamine to some other nitrogen needing molecule or some other biosynthetic pathway, that really is the transfer of an amino group from glutamate or glutamine to whatever is accepting it. And such reactions are called transamination reactions. The transfer of amino groups is a transamination reaction. So here we see very briefly the synthesis of aspartate. Aspartate is an amino acid. It needs an amino group. And so we make aspartate by taking glutamate as our amino group donor and oxaloacetate, another old buddy, and when that transamination reaction occurs, when that amino group is transferred from glutamate to oxaloacetate, 
we're left with alpha ketoglutarate, right? Because that's what glutamate was when we started, and aspartate. That's how we make aspartate. Pretty cool, right? Once again, getting at the idea that the citric acid cycle is our metabolic hub, here are two citric acid cycle intermediates essentially trading amino acids between each other, trading amino groups between each other, and allowing glutamate to make aspartate. As usual for any metabolic process, there are a relatively small number of reaction types that are used to make amino acids. Transamination, we just talked about. Transfer of one carbon units, in other words, transfer of methyl units, formal units, uh, side chains or um, groups that contain single carbons. In fact, amino acids even share a small number of common precursors, as we saw in our final citric acid cycle lecture chunk. And so really, there's not much that goes into making amino acids, because we're only using a handful of reaction types, and we're only using a handful of precursors. All of the carbon skeletons of all of the amino acids, that is, all of the non-amino group portions of all of the amino acids, except for one, histidine, come from glucose metabolism. So glutamate, glutamine, proline, and arginine, they all come from alpha-ketoglutarate, uh, of course, part of the citric acid cycle, part of glucose metabolism. Aspartate, asparagine, methionine, threonine, isoleucine, and lysine all come from oxaloacetate. Serine, serine, I'm sorry, serine, cysteine, and glycine all come from 3PG. Phenylalanine, tyrosine, tryptophan all come from PEP, phosphoenolpyruvate, and valine, alanine, and leucine all come from pyruvate directly. You see that histidine comes from ribose 3-phosphate, and in order to make these amino acids, we need this molecule erythrose 4-phosphate as well. Those bad boys come from the pentose phosphate pathway, the one pathway that we're really not going to discuss as part of this lecture. So again, Glucose metabolism in general and the citric acid cycle more specifically is the metabolic hub of the cell. Everything really comes from or feeds into this central corridor of metabolism. The citri citric acid cycle is said to be amphibolic, like an amphipathic molecule is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Amphibolic pathways are both catabolic and anabolic. They are involved in breaking molecules down as well as making other molecules that are needed. I showed this figure once before, but I'll show it again here where it has more context. We can break amino acids down metabolically <clears throat> and feed them into the citric acid cycle this way. And we can also steal from the citric acid cycle in order to make these amino acids in this way. Again, we touched on this concept already when we wrapped up the citric acid cycle lectures, but important to reemphasize it here. So let's go back to actually making amino acids and do that in a little bit more detail. The enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase, or GDH, is responsible for that reductive amination that we just talked about. This enzyme catalyzes the synthesis of glutamate from alpha-ketoglutarate and ammonia ion. So again, this reductive amination that we've already seen is catalyzed by the enzyme glutamate dehydrogenase, a good name for that enzyme, because it suggests that a redox reaction is occurring, which is indeed correct, a redox reaction which results in the formation of glutamate. We need a strong reducing agent for this. Remember, we need a lot of energy to force this to happen. And in this case, that energy comes from electrons that are being carried by our specialized high power electron carrier, NADP, NADPH. Glutamate is the amino group donor in living cells. Again, it works as a shuttle, bringing that amino group around the body, around the cell, so that it can be donated to any metabolic process that requires nitrogen. Alpha-ketoglutarate is the amino group acceptor in living cells. If you have an amino group as a molecule that you just have to get rid of, call yourself over an alpha-ketoglutarate, and alpha-ketoglutarate would be happy to accept that amino group, that ammonia ion, to become glutamate and carry it wherever it's needed. So alpha-ketoglutarate accepts amino groups and carries them away as glutamate, and glutamate donates amino groups, bringing them to you when needed, becoming alpha-ketoglutarate. This is how nitrogen gets into and out of normal cellular systems. Ammonia goes to alpha-ketoglutarate to become glutamate, and then glutamate brings that wherever it's needed and donates that ammonia group going back to becoming alpha-ketoglutarate. 
That second reaction that we talked about, the amination reaction, is catalyzed by glutamine synthetase. This is the enzyme that catalyzes the formation of glutamine. Remember we discussed synthetases as biosynthetic enzymes that require the energy of ATP? Well, there we see it. Glutamate and an ammonia ion becomes glutamine through the power of ATP, making that a synthetase enzyme. These two reactions, the transamination, I'm um, not the trans, the reductive amination and the amidation, both serve to fix inorganic nitrogen in the form of ammonia to organic molecules, carbon containing molecules such as amino acids and uh, nucleotides. So glutamate dehydrogenase and glutamine synthetase are responsible for getting the vast, vast majority of nitrogen into organic molecules through its ammonia form. Now here's something to prepare you for a cumulative final. The Km of glutamine synthetase is much lower than the Km of glutamate dehydrogenase. What implications does that have for us? Why don't you pause the lecture for a moment and chew on that for a bit. Well, what that means is that when nitrogen concentrations are low, the better binder is going to win the competition for binding that limited nitrogen. Who is the better binder? The better binder is the enzyme with the lower Km. So the better binder for limiting amounts of nitrogen, or limiting amounts of ammonia right now, is glutamine synthetase. So that means when ammonia levels are low, it's GS that's going to win the battle for it, and it's going to be glutamine that's made primarily. Very little of that ammonia in limiting supply will be able to be used by GDH because GDH doesn't have the binding power to capture that ammonia, making glutamate. <laughs> but this depletes glutamate levels, right? Because if GS is active, all of our glutamate is going to be used up to make glutamine. Glutamate is actually made by a reductive amination reaction, we saw that, where the glutamine side chain is the donor to alpha-ketoglutarate, so essentially glutamate begins cannibalizing itself to make glutamine. So what ha happens when ammonia levels are low is all of the glutamate is used up to donate that residual ammonia to glutamine. Pretty strange that plants would use up almost the entirety of their primary nitrogen uh, shuttle making glutamine instead of glutamate, and we really don't understand why that is. Why plants utilize nitrogen in this way, especially when those nitrogen levels, those ammonia levels are low, is still unclear. It's still under debate and under study, but it's a good example of how cells, for whatever their reasons might be, keep precursors moving in a preordained direction using the biochemistry of the enzymes responsible for those reactions in the pathway. By evolving different KMs, essentially cells are stacking the cards towards who or which enzyme should win the battle for a limiting resource and get to whatever end result it has been evolved to get to. So these different KMs between GDH and GS, both fighting over the same limiting substrate, always gives one enzyme an advantage over the other, and that's what the cell wants. This is a key and universal concept in biochemistry. This is how pathways are kept moving forward in one direction. Uh, it's one opportunity for us to see it here in this material. But if you get into advanced biochemistry, you'll see this arise again and again. So that's a lot about uh, ammonia transfer, transamination reactions. And certainly this is an ammonia lecture, but these one carbon transfer reactions are almost equally important to ammonia, uh, to amino acid biosynthesis as transamination reactions are. So let's take a side detour quickly here and just introduce these one carbon transfer reactions. Making amino acids of the serine family commonly need these one carbon transfers, and the serine family is made up of serine, glycine, and cysteine. In addition to being amino acids, serine and glycine are also precursors for other biosynthetic pathways, and making the amino acids of this family starts with 3-phosphoglycerate, our old friend from the second phase or stage of glycolysis. Just to remind you, it's 3-phosphoglycerate that becomes 2-phosphoglycerate, becomes a phosphoenol pyruvate, and then goes on to become pyruvate itself. Here, 3PG is going to be modified to become a molecule called 3-phosphohydroxypyruvate, and that will be modified through one step into 3-phosphoserine, and that phosphate will be lost, leaving us with serine itself. I should say, I don't expect you to know 
any of the biosynthetic pathways that we cover here other than the formation of glutamate and glutamine. And so you, you don't have to know this pathway. I'm just showing you how we get to serine. So the biochemistry that's occurring here is, is that in the first step, 3PG is oxidized and NAD is reduced and it's carbon-2 specifically on 3PG that's oxidized and that yields our 3-phosphohydroxypyruvate. Then a transamination reaction occurs where glutamate comes in again as our amino group donor, our shuttle. Glutamate reverts to being alpha-ketoglutarate and we add that nitrogen containing compound, that amino group, onto 3-phosphohydroxypyruvate yielding 3-phosphoserine. That phosphate's then hydrolyzed off of 3-phosphoserine, leaving us with serine itself. So we really didn't need a one-carbon transfer reaction to make serine. We can make serine uh, just by um, a transamination reaction here. But to convert serine to glycine, we do need a one-carbon transfer reaction. Serine hydroxymethylase is the enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of a single carbon unit from serine to an acceptor. So we're actually removing carbon from serine. The acceptor here is THF, tetrahydrofolate. THF might be a, a coenzyme that you've heard of in other classes. It's uh, involved in a lot of different metabolic and dietary disorders. So serine offloads a single carbon unit to, to uh, tetrahydroxyfolate. And uh, again, that's a vitamin from folic acid, critical for pregnant women. We talked about that in class. And once this one carbon transfer unit is transferred as a methyl group, as a methylene group, we are left with glycine. So once that serine loses that carbon, we have glycine left. That methylene group stays with THF uh, until this single methyl group is needed by some other acceptor and so THF is a methyl group shuttle the same way that glutamate is an, ami an amino group shuttle. And I should let you know that there are other carriers of one carbon transfer units that work as shuttles as well. Biotin is a molecule that some of you may have heard of. Biotin is regularly used in laboratory applications and biotin metabolically is really just a one carbon transfer unit shuttle just as THF is here. The conversion of serine to cysteine requires sulfur because cysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid. Think of disulfide bridges between two cysteines, and we'll just very quickly scratch the surface of this again. I will not ask you to give me the details of this ever again, but in plants and bacteria, serine is first acetylated to form a precursor called O-acetylserine. Acetyl-CoA is the donor group of this acetyl group, in fact, so another use of acetyl-CoA itself, uh, independent of glucose metabolism. The enzyme responsible for catalyzing this reaction is serine acetyltransferase, very good name for it. O-acetylserine is then converted into cysteine when a sulfide group is provided by a sulfide donor. That sulfide donor goes by the name of 3'-phospho-5'-adenyl sulfate. The sulfide group attacks and displaces the acetyl group, so it is a substitution. The acetyl group was really only there to activate the serine molecule, and we're left with cysteine. Interestingly, we and all other animals lack the enzymes required for this pathway, so we make cysteine a different way. In our cases, it's methionine that's the sulfur donor, but we'll leave that to another class. Methionine cannot be made in animals, and so this leads us to the idea of an essential amino acid. All of the amino acids that we cannot biosynthetically make ourselves are essential amino acids, and we must get these through our diet exclusively. Therefore, what that means is that for us, we can't make cysteine unless we dietarily get methionine in into our bodies. That kind of makes cysteine a essential amino acid by proxy because we can only make cysteine with methionine and we can't make methionine ourselves we must get it from our diet so we can only make cysteine if we're consuming methionine so our sulfur groups for cysteine come exclusively from our diet essentially in animal cells like our own methionine reacts with ATP to form a molecule that has a high methyl group transfer potential just like we've seen molecules with high phosphate transfer potentials and this activated methyl group transfer molecule this activated form of methionine is then a one carbon transfer unit carrier incidentally what does this molecule really want to donate if it's a high methyl group 
transfer for potential molecule, of course it really wants to transfer and donate that methyl group. That's what we mean by that. So here it is in all its glory, the cysteine bio uh, biosynthetic pathway of our own cells very quickly. Methionine and ATP come together to form an activated form of methionine called S-adenosyl methionine. Then we get our transmethylation reaction. That methyl group is swapped, giving us S-adenosyl homocysteine. Water comes in to displace the adenosine. The adenosine is released, leaving us with homocysteine, which has just been hydrated. Serine enters now and displaces the water, giving us a Frankenstein molecule that is cystothionine. That is really serine and cysteine linked together. And then we lose both a single ammonia molecule, which will be instantly absorbed by alpha-ketoglutarate. And we also leave alpha-ketobutyrate and cysteine is left alone. Crazy man, right? So that is just a taste of the complexity of the biosynthetic pathways that are needed to make some of our more difficult to make amino acids. And again, just to be clear, you will never be asked anything about the animal biosynthetic pathway of cysteine at all. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for how uh, complex these biosynthetic mechanisms can get and also give you a flavor for what you might be asked to do at a graduate level biochemistry course. Once this molecule gives up its methyl group, uh, once this activated S-adenosylmethionine gives up that activated methyl group, again it becomes S-adenosyl homocysteine that becomes hydrolyzed to homocysteine and serine and homocysteine come together to give us uh, that cysteine molecule that we're after alpha ketobutyrate released as a byproduct. Again, this is not how plants do it. This is only how we do it because we lack the enzymes that were needed to make cysteine the simpler way that I showed you before. So back to the idea of these essential amino acids. All 20 amino acids are needed to make proteins. We're uh, obviously not surprised by that. Using our analogy from the very second week of this course, uh, if we think of each individual amino acid as a letter of a 20-letter alphabet, we can't make all of the words we need in English without each of the 26 letters in our alphabet. We can't make all of the proteins needed for life without all 20 letters of the amino acid alphabet. E. coli can make all 20 of those letters. It can make all 20 of those amino acids from scratch, de novo using individual metabolic pathways and individual atoms and molecules and groups from other molecules. So E. coli doesn't need to consume a single amino acid. They can make all 20 de novo from scratch. We cannot do this. This poses a bit of a paradox for us. We need all 20 amino acids to make the proteins we require for survival, yet we can't make all 20 amino acids that we need for survival. So the amino acids we cannot make, we must obtain from our diet. We are quite literally fully dependent on the food we eat, not only for ATP and energy production, but also for these components we've lost the ability to make, such as the essential amino acids. It's essential that we get these amino acids from our food, and so hence the name of this group of amino acids. And here they are. The essential amino acids are valine, tryptophan, threonine, phenylalanine, methionine, as we've already said, lysine, leucine, and isoleucine. Histidine is essential dietarily for, for children because they're growing so fast and they have so much cellular division that they need higher levels of histidine than their cells can make. But we make low levels of histine through a very inefficient biosynthetic process in adult cells, and that low level of histine is enough to maintain histidine levels in adult cells. Arginine. Uh, we can synthesize arginine in our own cells, mammals can, but we use that arginine specifically and primarily for the urea cycle in order to catabolize nitrogen-containing compounds. We'll talk about that in the third chunk. So almost all of the arginine we make, we use for the urea cycle, meaning the arginine that we need to actually build proteins, we have to get from our diet. So some of these essential amino acids we can make, we just can't make them in quantities enough to support protein synthesis. And again, in histidine's case, this is especially true in children. Also, it's important to know that there's no storage form for excess amino acids. We can store excess sugars as glycogen. We can store excess uh, uh, nucleotides, but we can't store excess amino acids. So there's nothing like fats or glycogen or storage forms of 
of nucleotides for amino acids. Uh, we have to either use them or lose them. So our existing proteins are the only source of amino acids, the proteins that we are recycling from our own cells or the proteins that we're consuming from our diet. We can get these essential amino acids from no other place. Some of you may have seen pictures of starving individuals uh, either in other countries right now or perhaps World War II survivors from the Holocaust. And what you always notice is how skeletal such people look. They are literally skin and bones. The most protein-rich tissue type in our cells, in our bodies, is muscle. And so upon starvation conditions, we do digest our own muscle tissue as a source of amino acids. Literally, life will digest itself if necessary. Uh, the most amino acid rich tissues will be the first to go because we need these essential amino acids to support life in other cells. So very interesting stuff. Again, fairly complex, especially for the nature of this course, but interesting nonetheless. To summarize what we talked about, we started with this idea of an amino group shuttle. We have glutamate as the amino group donor in living cells, and alpha ketoglutarate is the other side of that coin, being the amino group acceptor in living cells. We have transamination reactions and one carbon unit transfer reactions being the most commonly used reaction types for amino acid biosynthesis. And the amino acids we cannot make or the amino acids we just can't make in high enough concentrations, we must obtain from our diet, and those are the essential amino acids. I hope you found some of this anabolism of amino acids interesting, uh, and we will now switch gears in the last and final chunk of this Lecture 18 series to talk about the catabolism of amino acids and how we get rid of nitrogen containing compounds without killing cells with ammonia and we will see arginine show itself again as part of the urea cycle that that lecture chunk will revolve around.